just want to take a minute before we jump into our lesson tonight to thank you for uh, tuning in. I know many of you have been faithfully uh, tuning in on Thursday nights and, and uh, even inviting some other people to join us. And uh, we, uh, we have been streaming to uh, 80 to 100 households each week, which is, um, which is exciting. It's just a, it's just a neat thing. And, and uh, we're I uh, have a bunch of people tuning in from this area as well as other parts of the, of the country. I just want to give a shout out to Grace Church up in Hamilton, Michigan. S- several of the, the youth up there are joining us as we, uh, as we uh, stream our front lines. And as, uh, they're looking for uh, just some, uh, some to join us and be a part of what we're doing way down here in, in South Carolina. I want to... I want to start by telling you guys a, a story. This goes a, a ways back. It was uh, years ago before I actually moved to South Carolina. I had an opportunity to come uh, to the South. I was living up in the Chicago area, going to Bible school up there, and I had a chance to, uh, to visit Savannah for the very first time. Savannah, Savannah, Georgia, of course. And uh, myself and some friends, we, uh, we walked around the, uh, the historic district of the, of the city and then uh, went to look for something to eat for dinner. We ended up down on River Street, and we were walking and looking in the shops and trying to find a restaurant and just kind of looking at menus and those kind of things. And the street was crowded, and uh, there's a lot of people. The weather was nice. People were sitting uh, inside, outside, the restaurants and the bars that are there. And, and as we were kind of looking around, all of a sudden I heard some, some shouting. And, uh, and, and so I looked down the road, and I thought I saw people yelling and holding signs, and I thought there was some kind of protest going on. Uh, but as they got closer, I realized that uh, they were shouting basically condemnation at the people on, on River Street. They had these signs that listed uh, all kinds of different sins, and, and some of them were pretty huge, five, six feet tall. And, uh, you know, it said all these different kinds of people, you know, adulterers and thieves and, and, and all these kinds of things, and basically it, these, all of these signs in one way or another said, these people are going to hell. And as they were walking down and, and looking at the people in these restaurants and bars, they were, they were hatefully yelling at them that they were all going to go to hell. And, um, and man, I was, I, I, I was kind of speechless for a minute. I didn't really know what to think of this scene as I, as I watched it. And as I, as I saw them yell at people, and then the people who didn't like being yelled at get angry and start yelling back, kind of, you know, cursing and cussing at them. And I, I, I just got saddened by the whole scene. And then I became a little bit upset. I could feel kind of anger boiling up in me. I, I, I was upset that these people were driving people away from Christ instead of drawing them to him. And and there's no way, I thought, that, that this, this kind of method c- can be effective. There's, there's no way that they could know that, you know, this is going to work. You know, certainly if Jesus was there that day, I don't think he would have had that kind of approach. And, and honestly, there was no one who was coming up to them and saying, hey, what do I need to do to be saved? What do I need to do to receive Jesus as my Savior? If anything, they were yelling and, and, and making the situation even grow. And so it hit me as I was watching this that these people who were holding these signs thought that they were doing what they were supposed to be doing. They thought they were doing what God had called them to do and, and, and possibly even that they were doing what they thought they needed to do in order to go to heaven. And as I thought about this, it occurred to me that this was really kind of a, a good picture of, of the human race as a whole. Some of us, I think, are, are, are trying to do everything we can to get to heaven. If, if you ask someone some of the diagnostic questions and, you know, what, what percentage on a, on, a, on a scale of 0 to 100, you know, do you, do you believe are your chances of, of going to heaven and they give you an answer, you know, somewhere in that range, then you ask them why do you think you're going to get there? Oftentimes, more often than not, you're going to get a works answer, Right? Because I'm doing this or I'm doing that. And, and I'm trying to be good. I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on, on doing what's right or not failing too often, right? And so they're trying to do good stuff and hope that God will accept them. But then others, 
Others are just kind of cruising through life, either with absolutely no care for, for, for spiritual things, focus more on having a good time than on any kind of eternal realities. And so to these kinds of people, life is just kind of one big party. And so when, when I looked at the, these people that were eating and drinking, and then I looked at these religious people bearing their, their, their hateful signs, my, my stomach turned because I realized that neither approach was going to get them to heaven. The only way to gain God's favor and enjoy the benefits of forgiveness and eternal life is by entering into a relationship with Jesus. And so really when you boil it down, it it comes down to whether or not, as we've been studying over the last few weeks, whether or not the work that Jesus did on the cross is finished or not. Right? He either finished what he came to do or he didn't. And if he, if he didn't finish, then we have more to do. But here's the flip side to that. If he did finish, then it's all been done. It's all been done. If you would, guys, grab your Bible. Grab your Bible. Turn with me in your, in your Bible to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. I want to look at, at this cry that Jesus makes from the cross and, and, and try our best tonight to, to really understand its significance. John chapter 19, and we're going to look at verse 30 where we find it. John 19, 13. Hopefully you guys have found it. It says, When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now, I don't want you to miss, I know a bunch of you were here tuning in last week, and so I don't want you to miss the link between the fifth and the sixth cry. If you remember, we saw last week that Jesus was parched with thirst. And so the, the wine vinegar was put up to his lips, which fulfilled scripture, as we saw last week. And so what this would have done is this, this liquid would have loosened his tongue so that it wasn't sticking to the roof of his mouth as he was so dehydrated. It would have moistened his, his throat, his vocal cords, so that he could ultimately cry out, shout out, these words that we have translated in English, it is finished. I want you to notice that this verse is translated this way, it is finished. And that Jesus is not saying, I am finished. In some kind of defeatist sort of way, almost like he, he tried his best but wasn't able to accomplish what he was trying to accomplish. His death, listen, we've seen it. It was not an accident, right? It's not as if a great in injustice was done. In fact, by his death, justice, the justice of God, was fully satisfied so that we can be, as we'll see a little bit more in depth in a minute, declared righteous. Have you ever stopped for just a minute to think about the words that we use? I, I, I love language, and I, and I love the way that different languages and, and cultures use words. And so when I travel, when I go on mission trips, I try to learn as many words in the countries where I, I am at as I can. And um, listen, we, we have a language that is evolving, right, in English. As a matter of fact, there's, there's new words that are added every single year to our dictionary. And, and according to the, the Global Language Monitor and Merriam-Webster Dictionary, the top words for 2019 were, were these two words. The word woke and the word they specifically use as a gender neutral pronoun. I mean, I, I saw that and I, was, I thought to myself, what a, what a picture of our culture, right? This culture that seems to, to have this know it all, individualistic, moral confusion going on where, where everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes no matter what the Bible, no matter what their conscience, no matter what God says about the matter or anyone else for that matter. And so we, we, we have so many words but what I, I, I want to submit to you tonight that the greatest word ever spoken in all the history of the world is the Greek word to telestai. To telestai. If you would, wherever you're at tonight, in your in your living room, watching, tuning in, wherever you're watching from, if you would just say that word for me tonight, to telestai. And listen, here's the thing, right? I I just 
told you I believe this is the most important word that's ever been spoken. Well, most Americans have never even heard the word. But it is profoundly powerful. In English, this sixth shout contains three words. It's translated as we just read, it is finished. But in the original Greek, only one word is used, tetelestai. And this one word is, is packed with immense power. It's truly the greatest word ever uttered, and it was uttered by the greatest man who ever lived. And as he spoke it, it terrified hell and sent a thrill running through heaven. And so my hope tonight as we unpack this shout of the Savior is that we will hear it in all its freshness and forcefulness. For those of you who, who like to study the word, for those of you who don't just like to kind of skim over but go deep, you're in for a treat tonight because we're going to dive into some rich doctrine. But we're not just going to stay in the doctrine, right? We're going to move from, from doctrine to direction. We're going to take what we learn tonight and try to apply it to our lives based on what we know we're going to try to live it out. We could say it this way. We're going to go from position to practice. We're going to start by asking, what does it mean? And then we're going to end with, why does it matter? What does it mean and why does it matter? And so let's start by diving into doctrine and asking the question, what does it mean? Well, we learn from the other gospel accounts that Tetelestai, as Jesus said, it was actually shouted in a loud voice. It wasn't a whisper or a whimper, but the cry of a conqueror. It was a shout of victory, a word of triumph. And so I want you to understand that this is important for, for many different reasons. But, but one thing that's important to know is that this verb is in the perfect tense. That's significant because it refers to an action that has been completed in the past, but with results that continue into the present. It literally means this. It was finished, and as a result, it's forever done. Or we could say it this way. It was finished in the past. It's still finished in the present, and it will continue to be finished in the future. All has been done that needed to be done as Jesus hung upon that cross, paying the penalty of sin that we deserve to take for the sins that we've committed. Nothing more is needed. Literally, the word tetelestai means this. If you were to look it up, it means a goal achieved, a consummation, to bring something to a successful end, to carry out a task to full completion. And so when Jesus shouted tetelestai, people in the first century would have immediately understood what he was saying. They would have understood the meaning of this word because it was a common word. It was used in multiple contexts. Let me give you guys just a few different contexts in which this word was used in the first century. A farmer would use this word to describe an animal so beautiful that it didn't, it didn't seem to have any faults. He would look at this lamb and declare it's a telestai. A priest would examine a sacrificial animal for blemishes, and if it was perfect, he would say, Tetelestai, which reminds me of 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, where Peter writes, Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, listen, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. That's what Jesus was. The sacrificial lamb without blemish or spot. A carpenter, after finishing a perfect piece of furniture, would proudly cry out, to Tetelestai. It's finished. An artist, in a similar way, admiring his finishing touch on a canvas that needed no correction or improvement, would step back and pronounce, to Tetelestai. A servant would run to his master after he'd been given a task, a, a, a job, a chore, and after he'd completed it, correctly and, and, and fully would come back and report to his master to tell us die. A son who is sent on a mission by his father would not return until he took care of every last detail and when he was totally finished he could come back and report to his father to tell us die. Which, which reminds me again of John chapter 4 verse 34 where it says Jesus said to them my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Here's one of the ones that's most interesting to me. A prisoner was given a certificate of debt when they were convicted of a crime. 
And, it, and this, this certificate of debt was nailed to their cell door so that everyone could see the crime and the punishment that they were suffering for the crime. And so when the prisoners served their time, the, the indictment was taken down and the judge would write the word tetelestai across the charges. The freed prisoner was then given this document as proof that they had done their sentence. They'd paid it, the penalty. So if anyone questioned, they could take out this, this document and point to the word tetelestai and continue because they'd paid their debt to society. Listen to Colossians 2.14 in the New Living Translation as it paraphrases this verse. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. But then, of course, perhaps the most important place that this word was used was in the banking world. It was a banking term. When someone had a debt and it was paid off, the creditor would write to Telestai on the certificate of debt saying that it was paid in full. Over the last few years, they've actually found some of such documents. And in particular, archaeologists digging in Egypt uncovered the office of a first century accountant and discovered a stack of bills. And they had the Greek word to Telestai inscribed across each one to show that the debt was paid in full. It is finished. There's no defects. There's, there's no slivers. The picture is perfect. The job has been performed exactly to specifications. The prisoner is free. The debt is fully paid. Paid in full. It means that once something is paid for, you never have to go back and pay for it again. As a matter of fact, I'd be foolish to try that. And so the question becomes, if we understand this word and we understand the way that it was used, what exactly was it that was accomplished? What exactly was it that was finished? Well, if you would, in John chapter 19, look back at verse 28 with me for a minute, where it says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all was finished. This is the same word found in verse 30. It is finished because all has been completed. And so let's look at the four things, four things that were accomplished when Jesus shouted to Telestai. Firstly, I want you to see that his suffering was completed. His suffering was completed. Listen to something written in the Bible over 500 years before Jesus was even born in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3, where we see a prediction that Jesus would face intense suffering during his entire life. The prophet writes, he was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, despised, and we esteemed him not. Listen, Jesus was born to suffer. We learned a couple weeks ago that, it, that, that his physical sufferings were severe. The pain must have been intense. But that it was really nothing compared to to what he experienced on the cross as he became the sin sacrifice. As God the Father turned his back and the sun stopped shining for three hours, as the accumulated stench of sin was downloaded onto Jesus, as the sins of the whole world were poured onto him and as he suffered the wrath of God for those sins. But listen, that cup of suffering has been drained. The awful storm of God's wrath has been spent. The darkness has ended. The wages of sin have been paid. And divine holiness has been satisfied. His suffering is complete. To tell us die. Secondly, I want you to see the sacrifice was fulfilled. For hundreds of years, rivers of blood had flowed from the altar of God and and yet the penalty had never fully been paid. The book of Leviticus describes in detail this complex system that involved offering different animals to be sacrificed. The, the priest would take the animal, he would kill it, he would drain the blood and, and burn the carcass on the altar. In Leviticus chapter 16, we see in stunning detail what took place, not just every day, but on the annual Day of Atonement ceremony. 
the high priest would offer up two goats in sacrifice. One was sacrificed and the blood was sprinkled beyond the, the veil on the atonement cover of the Holy of Holies. And then the priest placed his hand on the other goat and, 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 and symbolically transferred the sins of the people onto the innocent animal as he sprayed it with blood. It was then released outside the camp. Listen, when Jesus died, he died as the final and perfect sacrifice. His blood opened the way into the Holy of Holies, which was vividly pictured when the veil tore from top to bottom in two pieces as he took his final breath on the cross. And he's also the scapegoat who was crucified outside the camp. He was killed outside the city of Jerusalem on the outskirts, taking the penalty of sinners who, trans, who transfer their sins onto him. Leviticus 16.22 pictures what Jesus did on our behalf. It says, The goat shall bear all their iniquities on itself to a remote area. Listen, Jesus was in that remote area when he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Hebrews 13.12 explains, So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Listen, God has always demanded a sacrifice, and more specifically, a blood sacrifice for sin. There is no way we can meet this requirement because we are all sinful. So he sent his son to die in our place, shedding his blood, paying the price, the only one who never sinned, and offering himself as the final sacrifice for our sin. I want you to see tonight that Jesus is both priest and sacrifice. Hebrews 10 verses 11 and 12 says it this way, And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins, but when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Listen, I want you to see tonight that the work of Jesus is complete. He is no longer working. He is no longer standing. He is no longer hanging on the cross, no matter what you see in so many churches across the country, because his work is done. He is seated. His mission has been accomplished. It is finished. Listen, that means so many things. It means that, that Judaism has reached its completion in Christ. He's fulfilled it and, and, and the whole sacrificial ceremonial system is done. It means that the mass is unnecessary because the sacrifice has been accepted. Anyone in today's age, that is the one we call A.D., right? In, in, in the year of our Lord, Anno Domini, who suffers any kind of religious sacrifice, who goes through any kind of system, is misguided because it is finished. The sacrifice of the Savior is sufficient. Christ has completed everything to tell us die. To tell us die. Christ has completed it. Thirdly, I want you to see this that Satan was defeated. Satan was defeated. Listen. There's no doubt that Satan has some power, that he still has some sway in our world. But I want you to understand tonight that he is a vanquished foe. He may have thought the cross was his point of greatest victory, but it was anything but that. Hebrews 2.14 says that through the death, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. And 1 John 3, 8 makes it clear that when Jesus died, he fully paid the price. John writes, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Listen, I want you to understand tonight that Satan was fully expecting Jesus to say, I am finished. But what he got was different. Because Jesus cried out, it is finished. The payment has been paid. Satan is finished. The price has been paid. Satan is defeated. To tell us die. Fourthly, I want you to see that salvation was secured. 
Because everything has been done that needed to be done, we now have open access to God the Father. Theologians talk about the finished work of Christ, and this is done to communicate a profound spiritual truth. It's finished because there is nothing more that needs to be done. I love how Charles Spurgeon said it. He said, The great canon of God's justice has exhausted all its ammunition. There is nothing, nothing left to be hurled against the Son of God. There's no more ammunition. There's no more payment that needs to be made. I'm reminded of the preacher who mixed up his words one Sunday morning, which I've done on more than one occasion. But he mixed up his words on Sunday by telling people he was going to confound the scriptures when he meant that he was going to expound them or explain them. And so I sure hope that you're sticking with me tonight and that, that, that I'm not causing any confusion, but instead that we're growing in understanding together. And so I want to be as clear as possible tonight in explaining this. When we see each other again, or if you want to shoot me a call or an email, you can let me know how I did. When we put our faith in Jesus as our substitute, trusting his finished work on the cross as full payment for the wages of sin, I want you to see that there are four things that take place. Four things that take place. Firstly, regeneration takes place. We're given a new life. We, come a, we become a totally new person. Paul explained it this way in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You are familiar with it. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, behold, the new has come. The what has come, guys? The new has come. Regeneration happens. We're given new life. Secondly, justification. Justification. We've been declared righteous in, despite, in spite of our own sinfulness. Romans 5.1, Paul said, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying God's righteousness has made a way for us to be right with him. Listen, this, this, this word justification is a legal term from the world of law. And so to justify means to declare not guilty. To declare not guilty. I, I've heard some people um, explain it this way. It's just as if I had never sinned. And, and listen, that's, it's, it's, it's a good way maybe to remember the, the meaning behind the word, but it, it falls short. It falls short because it means so much more than just that. One theologian defines it this way, an instantaneous legal act of God in which he thinks of our sins as forgiven in Christ's righteousness as belonging to us. I want you to see the two sides of this word as it is directly related to the sacrifice of Christ. We are declared righteous. Our sins are not counted against us. And we are credited, right? We receive the righteousness of Christ. Romans 8, 1, Paul said it. There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Your sin record is wiped away. And you are credited with the perfect, eternally secure righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so to be declared righteous is to be positionally righteous, even though we don't deserve it, even though we've done nothing to deserve it. It's a fact. I know even though sometimes we may not feel like it is. I want you to let the deep meaning of 2 Corinthians 5.21 sink in tonight. You know this verse, but have you really, really personalized it? Paul says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of of God. Justification happened as Jesus cried out this word to Telestai. Thirdly, I want you to see adoption was made possible. That we've been brought into God's family and that we will never be cast out. 
I love what Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verses 15 and 16. Listen to these verses. He says, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Adopted into his family. Sons and daughters of the king, brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we see regeneration, justification, adoption, and fourthly I want you to see sanctification. We've been set apart and we now become a part of the process of being changed, of being molded and shaped into the image of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Listen, we are unfinished projects, but know that Christ will complete his work in us. Paul said it this way in Philippians 1 6, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Since Jesus finished his work for us, I want you to see he will finish his work in us. Since he finished his work for us on the cross, he will finish and complete his work in us as we grow closer to him. So listen, guys, we, we dove into some deep doctrine, right? But now I want you to see that, that, that we need to decide our direction. We need to determine where we're going to go. And so we need to ask the question, why does it matter? Why does it matter? And so I want to conclude tonight with some practical things that we can do to apply, to apply this important doctrine to our lives. And answer this question, hopefully, why does this word to tell us die really matter? Listen, firstly, I want you to see, since Jesus paid it all, there is nothing more that needs to be done. Listen, salvation is not a do-it-yourself project. It's not a DIY, right? It's not even a 50-50 arrangement where you do your part and Jesus does his. Jesus has done it all so that you don't have to because you couldn't. Some of you maybe are trying to clean yourselves up in order to make yourself more presentable to God. Well, listen, the bad news is that you can't make enough changes in order to meet God's requirements. Isaiah 64, 6 says, All our righteous de deeds are like a polluted garment. The good news is this, though, that you don't have to. You don't have to because Jesus did it for you. Listen, let's be real tonight, okay? We need to stop trying to work our way. And we need to stop performing. Our acceptance is not based upon anything that we do, but on what has already been done for us. And listen, for some, these are shocking words. Because there's so many people out there so many. Listen, I, I, I run into people on a regular basis who are trying to do something in order to be acceptable to God, thinking that some kind of combination of good works will get them closer to God. And maybe someday when they, when they die, maybe there's on some cosmic scale going to be their evil deeds and their righteous ones on one side. And oh, let's, let's hope the righteous ones win out so that I can go to heaven. Listen, sin is only forgiven by the shed blood of Jesus on the cross. And so to put it into a, into a math equation of sorts, Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. Jesus plus nothing equals forgiveness. Jesus plus nothing equals New life, regeneration, justification, adoption, right? All the things we've been talking about. We don't bring anything to the table. We need to come to a point where we realize that we are spiritually bankrupt. And because Jesus cried to tell us that it is finished, we can have our sin debt canceled and for no other reason. Since he paid it all, we don't have to. One of the things I often hear when I invite someone to church is, Something along the lines of, yeah, I just need to get a few things in order. I just need to clean a few things up, right? And, and then I think I'll be, I'll be ready. Maybe I just need to get my life back on track. Guys, listen. 
If you're ever talking to someone and they say something along those lines, say, listen, you don't have to clean yourself up before you come. Come as you are and let Jesus clean you up. Since Jesus paid it all, there's nothing more that needs to be done. Secondly, everything has been done, but salvation must be received in order for it to be activated in your life. It needs to be received for it to be effective in your life. The debt has been paid in full. We've seen that, we've seen that but it would only be applied to the record sheet of your life if you ask for it to be done. John 1.12, John says, But to all who did receive him, did what, guys? Receive him, who believed in his name, uh, underline, circle, highlight those two words in your Bible, John chapter 1, to receive and believe. But to all who re did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Believe that Jesus accomplished it. Believe that Jesus did what he said he came to do upon the cross and receive him as the redemption, as, 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 the, as the way to new life. Believe what he has done for you and receive him as your Lord and Savior. Almost 200 years ago on, on August 1st, 1834, the British Slavery Abolition Act went into effect. This act had been championed by, by Christians, including the pastor Wilberforce, for, for many years. And, and when this act officially went into effect, slaves all across the British Empire were officially freed in that very moment. But, but most of the slaves weren't actually in England at this point in time. They were in Africa, and many of them were in the Caribbean, in the colonies that the British had in those places. And so what they did is they immediately sent ships to go tell the colonies, to tell these slaves, to proclaim that they were free. Well, crossing the Atlantic on a, on a sailing ship in, in, in the 1830s took about six weeks, and that was with good conditions. And so these ships took about two months to cross the Atlantic. And, and, and as they arrived into these ports, they would cry out to all the people on these busy docks that... By order of the king, all slaves are hereby free. Listen, here's what I want you to understand. They'd actually been freed months ago. Two, three, sometimes even more months ago. But they had not heard the good news. They had no idea. And so they still needed to believe and receive the good news that they were free. Listen, as Jesus finished his payment for the sins of the world on the cross, you were released from slavery some 2,000 years ago. As Jesus cried out, it is finished. You were freed from the slavery of sin. But maybe tonight, you're hearing this for the very first time. Well, my question for you is, will you believe? in what Jesus has done? And will you receive the freedom that has already been provided for you? Guys, listen. It's not a matter of whether you're wanted. Jesus proved that you're wanted and, and, and loved more than you could ever understand by dying on the cross for each and every one of you. The issue isn't whether you're wanted, it's whether you're willing and so the question is, what are you waiting for? If you, want, if you want some work to do, then put into practice the words of Jesus in John 6, 29. This is the work of God, he says, that you believe in him who he has sent. We try to overcomplicate it. We want to be a part of it. But everything has been done. We just need to receive in order for it to be activated in your life. Thirdly, I want you to see that if you're saved, you are eternally secure. 
If you are genuinely converted, you cannot lose your salvation. Listen, I want you to see that this means, what this means is that you only need to ask your Savior to save you once. One time. To cry out in faith to Jesus for salvation is enough. Once you're saved, you're always saved and you don't need to keep asking him to save you. You get to heaven by what Jesus has done. And you stay there by what he has done, not by any doing. Ultimately, if you think you stay in heaven by your doing, then you misunderstand the whole message, the whole good news of the gospel. And listen, if you misunderstand the message of the gospel, you could be done instead of believing that it's been done for you. Listen, when we die, there's no need for final rites or to receive some kind of blessing or to do some kind of confession of sins. This cry from the cross confirms that it has all been done for us. Our sins were paid in full and through our faith in the substitute, Jesus, they've all been forgiven. And because of this, I want you to see tonight, even in the midst of the darkest days, even in the midst of the toughest trials, you can have hope. You can have joy. You can have peace instead of dread and worry and anxiety. Listen, one of the best ways that I've heard it explained is this. I've done a lot of flying in my life. Been on a lot of planes, been through a lot of airports. And when you're at a gate of an airport, when you're waiting on a flight, watch this the next time you go. There's, 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 there's two very obvious types of people. There are those who are very patiently waiting to board the plane. And there are those who are anxiously pacing, checking with the ticket agent, watching the screens closely, and then pacing some more. And so here's my question. Do you want to know the difference between these two groups of people? Here's the difference. There are those who are patiently waiting because they have a confirmed ticket. They have a confirmed seat on that plane while others are flying standby. Listen, if you're in, in, in Christ, you have a confirmed ticket. You know. Listen, those who are flying standby, they, they're not sure. They don't know if, if they're going to make it. If you're in Christ, you have a confirmed ticket. There's no pacing, no anxiously looking at the screen, no constantly checking. You are good to go. You know you're good to go because it doesn't depend on you. It doesn't depend on anything you've done. It doesn't depend on some list of sins or righteous deeds. It depends on what Jesus has done. And because of that, you can have assurance. You can know without a shadow of a doubt because you believe in what he's done for you that you will spend eternity with him. If you're saved, you're eternally secure. And fourthly, I'll finish with this. Jesus' work is finished, but ours is just beginning. Jesus' work on the cross is once and for all finished, but our work is just beginning. Once we receive Jesus into our lives, Listen, we're responsible. We're, we're given ambassador, ambassadorship as representatives to take the message of the completed work of Jesus to all people. According to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we're to go with the gospel of done to, to, to our community, to our county, to our country, and to the ends of the earth. It says, but you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Listen, we can all carry out that beginning part, right? We can be witnesses for Christ right where we're at. In our homes, with our friends, our, our, our neighbors, our teammates, our, our classmates. I know right now it's a little bit different. But we still have opportunities to reach out. I know you guys are, are texting and, and, and chatting and emailing. We still have opportunities to reach our community. 
Listen, some of you have maybe been with me to places that we could consider the ends of the earth. But we can do things even now while we're confined in our houses. Listen, Jesus' work is continuing even in these unprecedented times of, of, of quarantine and pandemic. And it's done. His work is primarily accomplished through us. And so are you willing to allow him to use you to accomplish his work? We can, we can share. We can, we can email. We can even mail invitations to live stream our Easter services this Sunday. Who can you invite? Who can you reach? Listen, God wants to reach as many as possible with the message of salvation. He wants as many people as possible to understand this cry that it is finished. And he wants to work through us in order to do that. He wants to allow us to have the privilege and to grow our faith through the process of introducing people to Jesus. Listen, as I wrap up tonight, I just want you to, I want you to hear this cry. Can you hear it? 2,000 years ago, Jesus mustered up some strength, cried out to tell us that. It is finished. It's the most definitive declaration that's ever been spoken. That is the most complete, the most final answer against sin and its consequences that has ever or ever will be made. Jesus shouted it because he completed all that had to be done for you to receive all that you need to be saved. The divine demands have been met in the divine done. And so are you ready tonight to embrace the gospel of done a gospel that comes from a place of love for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life it comes from a place of love not a place of hate there was a young man who walked up to a pastor one day and asked what must I do to be saved? The pastor looked at him in the eyes and he said, I'm, I'm sorry, son, it's, it's too late. It's too late. And the man said, well, I mean, there, there, you've got to be joking. There's, there's got to be a way. I mean, there's, there, is there nothing I can do? And the preacher just shook, shook his head and said, no. There's nothing you can do. Because it's all been done. And the only thing you can do is believe. Is believe. Have you, I don't know who I'm speaking to right in this moment. Maybe it's you. Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ and his full and final payment upon the cross for your sins. If you haven't, why not now? Why not tonight? We're not guaranteed tomorrow. Listen, this virus is proof of that. But what we know is that this life is our opportunity to believe and to receive. So tonight, will you place your faith in what Christ has already accomplished for you on the cross? Will you hear this cry and know that all your sins have been paid for, each and every one, all the ones you have done, all the ones you will do? God's righteous wrath for those sins has been fully satisfied. And will you receive the free gift that he offers because of what Christ has done on your behalf? A forgiveness, freedom, and new life.
Don't put it off. Simply believe and receive in what Jesus has done tonight. Let's pray. Father God, we... I believe we fail to fully be able to wrap our head around this word to tell us die. That we can't fully understand during those three hours of darkness what exactly Jesus was doing, what exactly it meant that he was paying for our sins. But God, you've called us simply to believe that that's exactly what he did. That that cup of suffering that he was so worried about drinking in the Garden of Gethsemane, that, that cup of separation, that, that, that cup of, of the wrath of God for the sins that the world has committed, that he fully drank it in every single drop. Every single sin was paid in full. God, I pray that you would help us to come to a deeper realization of what we've received of this salvation that you've given to us. For the many of us who've believed and received, God, may we rejoice in our salvation each and every day. May we be brought to a point of thankfulness and gratitude for your love and your mercy and your grace that you've poured out upon us even though we don't deserve it. May, may we be forever grateful for what Jesus did for us upon that cross to the point where he could cry out, it is, it is finished, it is paid in full. And God, if there's anyone tonight who's never placed their faith in Jesus, who's never received the forgiveness, the freedom, the, the, the new life, the, the love, joy, and peace that come from being indwelt by the Holy Spirit that's received from simply humbling themselves and receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior, God, that they would do that tonight. That they would simply bow their head and say, God, I believe in what Jesus has done for me that he fully paid for my sins upon the cross. That he was died, buried, and rose again on the third day. And I receive. I receive him as Lord of my life. As Savior, the one who saved me. By paying the penalty for my sins. God, if there's anyone who's never prayed that, that they would pray that tonight. That ton tonight would be the day of their rebirth. God, as we go into Good Friday tomorrow and Easter on Sunday, may we remember this word. We, may we remember what Jesus did for us upon that cross. And may we be driven to worship. May we be driven to praise you. for making a way where there was none, for giving us an opportunity to live for you on this earth and to be with you for eternity, even though we don't deserve it. And so it's in Jesus' precious, holy, and powerful name that we pray tonight. Amen. All right, guys, to next week, next Thursday, I hope you'll be back with us as we wrap up this series. We look at the very last statement that Jesus made upon the cross. Uh, but in between now and then, as you, as you just heard in my prayer, obviously we have Good Friday tomorrow. What, a, what an amazing time to remember everything we've studied over the last few weeks as Jesus hung on that cross for each and every one of us. And then the Easter celebration that he is alive. Proving, proving that he is God, that he's more powerful than death, more powerful than the devil, more powerful than sin, that he did exactly what he set out to accomplish on the cross, that he was the 100% God, 100% man, Savior of the world. 
Guys, I hope you'll join us Sunday and live stream our Easter services and celebrate and worship with us and then come back next Thursday as we wrap up uh, our series, Cries of Christ from the Cross, and look at the very last thing uh, that Jesus said as he uh, bowed his head and, and died for you and for me. Uh, thanks again for tuning in. I uh, just pray that each and every one of you is, is doing well and uh, just want to wish each and every one of you tonight a happy Easter. Uh, thanks again. God bless. Good night.